Hey guys, Pastor Adam here. I pray that this sermon resource bless you as you study God's Word. Make sure you have a Bible open and be expectant of what He's going to have to say to you. Also, as a reminder, this sermon resource, no matter how you're seeing it or listening to it, is not a replacement for being present in a local body of believers. Find yourself a church that you love, that preaches the gospel, that gets into the Word, plug in. If you're in West Michigan, if you're in Nuego County, I pray that Second Church would be a home for you. We'd love to have you here. I'll save you a seat. If you're not, I know that the Spirit is going to move you to find a church in your area. If you need help, reach out. I'll see what I can do to help. But that is so important, and so I pray that God would lead you to a place where you can belong. Enjoy the resource, and God bless. So we've come to the center of our worship service. That is this book. It is the Bible. It is this book that, that orients us to who we are as believers. It is the way in which we communicate to God. We have, we have two ways that we connect with him. We have prayer where we get to speak to him, and we have his word, the Bible, where he gets to speak to us. Um, I find that if you want to have a good relationship with a person, the easiest way to do that is to talk to them. We live in a strange world where social media makes it feel like we're really close to people when in reality they have no idea we exist. Um, it's the same way that I can say I'm friends with Ryan Reynolds. It's because I clicked a button and it says friends. I don't know him. He doesn't know me. But, and, and that was meant to be a joke, but we do that with people we know too. You ever see somebody go on a vacation and so you don't ask them about it because you saw it on Facebook? You ever wonder what it might be like if we just pretended for a minute that we weren't like connected and actually did some connecting? Anyway, rabbit trail over. So our way of connecting with God is through his word. And so I would encourage you to have a Bible open. Today we're going to be in the book of Matthew for a sermon that I'm calling Rules to Live By. And I know you've heard me say a lot that Christianity is not a faith filled with rules. And so maybe this seems counterintuitive. Just stick with me. It'll make sense at the end. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 19 through 34. Sort of as you turn there, um, I just want to orient you a bit to what's happening. So this is the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is sharing, this is like his great teaching. He covers everything that it is to be a believer. He talks about anxiety. He talks about uh, giving to the church. He talks about so many things. And in this moment that we're gonna pick up in, we're talking about worry and possessions. I think those are maybe the two things that as we enter into New Year's Eve and the normal celebrations that happen, it's something that people are often quick to think about is, you know, how am I going to do better next year? How am I going to have more or do more? What am I going to do, you know, for vacation next year? Do I need a new job? Do I need to figure out a way to get a rate? There's a lot of things that happen inside us as we come into New Year's. And, and maybe that's not you. Maybe you've figured out what life looks like and you're not super anxious. But I think that in general, we have a tendency as people to start to worry about things that Jesus is pretty clear that we shouldn't. And so we approach this place where Jesus gives what I would consider a pretty crystal clear illustration. And so that's where we're going to be today on the cusp of 2024. Begins this way. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is within you, if then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body, more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more, much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? 
Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Would you join me in prayer before we begin this morning? Father in heaven, we thank you for the way that you're at work in our lives. We thank you for what you're preparing for us. We thank you first and foremost for, for who you are to us. You are our God, and we are your people. We ask that you would be active here in this place this morning. Turn our eyes and our hearts towards you. Help us to know you better than we ever have. Don't let us leave here unchanged. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, okay, don't worry about tomorrow or next year or five minutes from now. I think it probably could also say. The, the point he's trying to get at the whole time is no matter what big things are happening in your life, no matter what big picture problem you might have, whether it's monetary or spiritual, no matter what it is, I've got this. That's what he's saying. And what I want you to do is sort of filter it through this last verse. And so I know typically when we, when we study the Bible, I usually start at the verse we started with and I end with the verse we ended with. I'm going to kind of do it backwards this morning. We're going to start with the end because uh, sometimes beginning with the end in mind helps us to understand the rest of it. And so he says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. well. Could it really be that simple, I wonder? If you just seek after God in everything, like everything, does that mean that, that you'll be provided for everything you could possibly want? Is that, is that the message that it's having? So like if I'm faithful to God in prayer and I seek after him, I can have the nicest car on the road. I can have the best house on the block. Is that, is that what he's saying? I don't think so. But I think it's really easy to fall into that, that temptation to say, well, if, if everything is given to me, then I can have anything I want. And what I want you guys to see as you look through this passage is not that God is promising to pour out the desires of your heart, but that if you orient your heart towards his kingdom and his righteousness, then your heart will align with his. And everything you have, you will recognize, comes from him. And there will be a, a washing over you of contentment no matter what it is that you have. It's the same way that Paul is able to say, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. That's not a passage about being able to overcome obstacles. That's a passage that comes on the heels of him saying, hey, sometimes life sucks. But I can do that because I have God. And so if I seek after him, the rest of it's fine. And so what I did was I broke down this idea of what these things are. And we're going to explore that together. So he says, all these things will be given to you. And I think it's important to recognize that, that he, he creates categories in this sermon that if we see, we can fit all the things of our life into as well. He creates these really interesting categories. And I made a list. Uh, the first part of the list is these treasures he talks about in verse 19. He says, don't store for yourselves treasures on earth. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. The, so treasures, I think, is a category. Then in verse 24, he talks about money, which I think is maybe easy to figure out. Um, then he talks about your heart in verses 21, 2, and 3. Um, then he goes into like, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. So food and drink. And then clothing. And to maybe break that down a little differently, I think that there's maybe four distinct categories here. There's power and wealth, basic life needs, love and respect, and then I think wisdom should be there as well, even though he doesn't list it. Those are the things that the Bible tells us we need. And I want you to, because we're going to go through this relatively quickly, I want you to remember that the one thing he didn't list in here was wisdom, which should be odd to you if he's talking about things that you need, because we hear repeatedly through the Old Testament that God, seeking God first, fear of God, knowledge of God, is the beginning of wisdom. So if he's talking about things you should seek after, I think it's ironic that he doesn't mention it, and you should notice that. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. But So these are the categories that he sort of creates for us. Um, power and wealth, I think, is maybe a modern way to explain. I'm just going to go back one. Is maybe a modern way to explain money and treasures. Uh, I think heart is probably going to fit into love and then also respect. And then everything else, I think, fits into basic life needs, just to get an idea of how I, how I put those categories together. 
And what you should probably notice is that those categories actually fit into two categories also. They fit into physical and then spiritual needs. Physical and spiritual needs. Sometimes you can get things given to you physically that, that fulfill a spiritual need for you. You ever had somebody come up when you're just having a really awful day and say, hey, can we pray together? And that, that's a physical thing that they did, but it fulfilled you spiritually. Or maybe you have a spiritual need that, that works itself out in ways that help other people physically. Like you just have a natural desire to serve other people. You have a servant's heart. And so you see someone who's, who's hungry and you feed them. That's a physical need that they had, but you fulfilled it through a spiritual gift. So the, I don't want you to think that the categories are so static that they always sort of exist separately. Please understand, the way that God designed us, everything sort of overlaps, which I think is really special because he created us in his image, which means that in everything God does, it all overlaps. There's nothing he does that kind of sits apart from itself. And so as we, as we operate, it's important to sort of keep in mind that what we are doing is both physical and spiritual. When we're kind to someone, it is both physical and spiritual. When we're not kind to someone, it is both physical and spiritual. So as we enter into a new year, what might it look like to remember always to be seeking after his kingdom so that other people see you seeking after his kingdom? Because I think you might look a little different if that's your primary function. And if you look a little different, then other people will notice that. The Bible tells us we'll be, we'll be recognized by the content of our character. People will know who we are as Christians, as believers, by the way that we behave. So I guess the question I get to ask now is, if I said to you, do you love Jesus out on the street somewhere, would it be obvious what your answer is before you speak? That's, I think, maybe what we can take away from this is, as we're thinking about the way that our needs are met or the way that we meet the needs of other people, it's important to recognize, and this is gonna be super cliche, and so you'll have to excuse me, but there is a hole in each of us that is Jesus-shaped. And there's no way that you're filling that hole for me, and there's no way that I'm filling that hole for you. And so if we try to do anything apart from Jesus, there will be obvious problems. So what would it look like to seek after his kingdom and his righteousness all the time and see that our needs are fulfilled that way, or to help other people to see that their needs are fulfilled that way? What would it mean when somebody's having a really rough day to point them not first to a counselor, but first to the Bible, or first to prayer? Or, I don't know, maybe a super obvious, but maybe not example, what if someone has a headache, and instead of first pointing them to aspirin, point them to prayer, to a God who heals infirmities? Not to say, like, don't take aspirin. Don't hear me wrong. I love aspirin. When I have a headache, aspirin's my buddy. But God should be involved in everything because he provides for us. And so as we seek after him, we can seek his kingdom and trust that he'll provide for us. So God, I pray that you would take away this headache. And then you take aspirin and you trust that he works through that. It's both because the whole world is created in such a way that everything overlaps. And so what I did is I created sort of a, a chart of sorts to show you sort of the way that things overlap. So you've got things that are spiritual, needs that are spiritual, physical needs, but you've also got delivery methods that are spiritual and delivery methods that are physical, and I think they work themselves out similarly to this. So wisdom is a spiritual need that is delivered to you spiritually. There's no like hard work you can do to grow in wisdom. Power and wealth, so like money or, or status or your job, none of those things can be delivered to you. You have to work for those things. But I think those are spiritual needs, which might make a whole lot of no sense to you. How does, how does my finances, how does my bank account, how does my job work itself out to be spiritual? In the beginning, even though so many of us probably don't love going to work, in the beginning, God created Adam, he created Eve, and he gave them jobs, and then sin. Work came before the curse, which means, love it or hate it, work is good. Work is a spiritual activity that God calls us to. In, in like church theological circles, we tend to use the word calling maybe more often than we should, but whatever it is that your job is, God has called you 
to that. It is the thing that he has chosen for you to be good at and to do, which means the, the money that you accumulate, the power that you have, the influence that you have in your circle is a result of a spiritual need. You have a spiritual need to have power and wealth because we're made in God's image and he is all powerful. So it's a natural thing for us. Then you have basic life needs. So like food, clothing, shelter, those sorts of things. Those are physical needs and you get those physically. I think that one's probably the other super obvious one. And then love and respect. That is a physical need. You feel love, but it's delivered to you spiritually. You can't hand someone love and say, here you go. There's a, an inside need in each of us that we can't fully explain. You can't quantify it. Actually, love is one of my favorite things to talk about when people say there isn't a God because you can't prove God through science. You can't prove love through science either. So why are you married? Why do you have a dog? Why do you like tacos? It's because love is something inside us. It is a spiritual thing. And yet, it's also very physical. So you've got all of these different things that God is teaching us. Jesus has this whole sermon that he's working through to help us understand how to handle each of these little challenges that we face. And then what ends up happening is we, in our weird brains, start worrying and having all these anxieties and all these stresses because of the opposite of each of these things. And so what ends up happening is we think about our needs and then we immediately start thinking about the things we're afraid of. So rather than go through a list of everybody's fears, the way that we did with everybody's needs, I don't think that's necessary because I think the categories work. I think the thing we're afraid of as it relates to our need for power and wealth is poverty. We're afraid we won't have enough. We're afraid we won't do enough. I think in our basic life needs, we're afraid maybe that we won't have food or clothing and shelter, but like, what does that really mean? That without those things, what happens? We die. And so the natural fear there is that we're not gonna, we're not gonna live or illness maybe, but what does illness lead to? So I think I just distill it down. Death is the thing we're afraid of. And then with regard to love and respect, I think shame, or maybe we could have put guilt there also. Those are the things that, that we fear there. And so as you sort of reflect on why it is we even have worry and anxiety, I wonder if it might be that we're trying to deal with tomorrow's problems today. And because we can't reach into tomorrow, there's this weird sense of uncertainty. Or we're carrying with us challenges from the past and we can't reach backwards either. And so we sit in this weird stressed out place where we don't quite know where we're going or how we're gonna get there. And we think we have a handle on things, but there's all these uncertainties because we exist in this one finite space. We exist today. We know there will be a tomorrow and we'll probably exist tomorrow also. And so since we can assume that we'll probably exist tomorrow, we start worrying about what's going to happen there. So Jesus gets really clear. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own, which is ironic because tomorrow's trouble is very similar to today's because they overlap. And that's our problem is we hear Jesus say, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. And we're like, no, no, no. If I don't do this, this will be a problem tomorrow. I have to stress. I have to do this. I have to work. I have to work harder. I have to work more. I have to work faster. What if we just slowed down a little bit and processed what God is trying to teach us when he says, don't be anxious about tomorrow? I'm reading a book right now called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. If you've, if you've ever encountered me outside of Sunday morning, you'll know I don't typically hold still very long. Um, I tend to have a to-do list that is longer than I can to-do in a day. And it works itself out to be that no matter how accomplished I end up being at the end of the day, there's still a ton I didn't get done. And I wonder how many of us are, are like that, whether at home or at work or with our friends or our, our hobbies. There's just so much to do. And so it, it's easy for us to start looking at these fears and think, well, you know, I just need more time in my day. What if I had 10 extra hours? If I said to you, if I gave you 10 extra hours today, if today was 34 hours long, what would you do with that? And I think if I gave you enough time, you'd come up with a list that would take up more than 10 hours. And so actually what you've done is not made better use of your time. You've just been busy for longer. Great. You got more of an endless list done. I think there's something really special about the reason Jesus is teaching this. And I want to just for a minute, I don't have a slide for it. I wasn't planning on doing this, but I think it's important. Think for a minute about the seven days of creation. 
you know, day one, light. You know, two and three and four and five and six. And then what happens on day seven? He rested. He's all powerful. He's not tired. He's not resting. He didn't like work for six days and go, man, okay, I need a minute. He didn't like wake up on the seventh day and go, you know what? I think I did enough. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna sip, sip some tea and watch the sun I invented rise. He doesn't do any of that. And so why? Why is there a rest? And then to push that a little further, why? So there's a Sabbath rule in the Old Testament. You must honor this day. You must stop and you must rest. And then in the New Testament, Jesus says, I came to bring you rest. Like your whole life can be restful. And you notice throughout Jesus' ministry that often before anything massive happens, he disappears and he goes off by himself and he, he does quiet, peaceful things. Like there's a pattern that we have to see here and the pattern that God points us to is if you're busy all the time, you're going to miss the things that I'm doing for you. There's no need for you to be busy all the time. How many of you, and, and I'm super guilty of this, and so I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand, but just think about this. Throughout the last year, how many of you used busy as a response when someone said, how are you? I did it all the time. How are you? Oh, I'm busy. Staying busy, just busy. What if we just slowed down a minute and looked around us and thought, what a gift. Then we wouldn't be stressed about tomorrow and the poverty we might experience or the shame we might have or the illness we might, like all of the things that we're afraid of might be put down. Maybe that's what God is trying to show us here. But I think what ends up happening is if we lose track of that, there's this question that pops up in our head. And the question ends up being, well, how do we overcome these fears? That's the message the world gives us, right? You just need to overcome it. Tighten your bootstraps and just get after it. And I think maybe the answer to this question is not quite as obvious as the world will lead us to believe. I think that if you, if you thought about it long enough, you might find that the answer to how do we overcome these fears is that we don't. You might think that you do, like, I've overcome the, the guilt and the shame of my life, and so I walk around free of those things, except when I'm not in conversation with somebody and everything's quiet and I have a chance to reflect because I know myself, and I start reflecting on all the things that I did and the guilt that I might have and the shame that I might feel. You can't fully escape those things. Or maybe you just, you trust that your body is healthy and you trust God to provide health for you, but in the quiet moments of your life, you're like, man, I'm getting up there in years, and this is about the time that my father got sick, and my mom's not doing well, and I wonder genetically if I should be getting checked out. Maybe I should make a doctor's appointment. And suddenly you're like, your prayer life has been totally interrupted. And so you might project that you don't worry about illness or death, but somewhere in the quiet spaces of your brain, it's there. We're going to like roll into tax season soon, which is like my favorite time of year for anxiety because everyone starts to wonder because they're looking at their income for the year and they're like, man, if inflation gets any more inflaty, I'm going to need a second job. It's like the whole world wants to remind us of all of the ways that we're supposed to be afraid. But the, the Bible's clear, we weren't given a spirit of fear. And so with all the things that we need, I think what Jesus is trying to teach here is that you don't overcome these fears because he overcome those fears on our behalf. He took all of those things for us. So if you're stressed about, I don't know, students in the room, you're stressed about next semester or where you're going to go to college or whether or not your transcripts are good, like, yeah, worry about that, maybe. But does it help you at all? Like, oh, well, what if I'm not going to get into a good school? You, you'll... Did you do the work? If you put the work in, you'll get into the school God wants you to get into. And I'm not saying, like, don't stress about anything because, you know, things will just happen. You have to do work. Remember I said work came before the curse. But if you're seeking after him and you're doing the things that he wants you to do, then you are doing the work, and you can trust that he'll provide for you in the ways that he knows you need. He's already done all of the work that you can't accomplish, and so when he calls you into all of the work that you can accomplish for him, you're putting him on display. And so if we bring back up 
all of those fears, think about the way in which Jesus took all of these things for us. The God of the universe who made everything, who everything was made through and for, gives up all of that and comes down to be born where animals eat with no medical care and no money, no resources. He has no, no title, no stature. He's a baby. He can't even feed himself. If you think about like the world of helplessness or the world of poverty, I think babies take the cake. Even animals, when they're born, have instincts that help them to figure things out like immediately. Not, not human babies. We are like the epitome of helpless. Christ understands our poverty and the fear that we have because he's gone through it with us. The shame that we feel over all the things that, that we experience in life, Christ understands because while he was hanging on that cross, he absorbs that, that stuff that, that we lay awake at night thinking about, the guilt and the shame, he takes that from us. He gets it because he's experienced it on our behalf. And then I don't feel like I have to explain a whole heck of a lot about death. I think he understands that one in a way that maybe we're not ever going to because I don't think crucifixion is the, the destiny that any of us are going to face. I don't think any of us in this room are gonna get nailed to a cross. Though I might push a little hard and say perhaps we deserve that. But through Christ, we don't have to. Through Christ, the poverty that we have is gonna be taken away. We get to live in a place with streets of gold. Through Christ, the shame that we have is taken away. Then we're wrapped in a robe of his righteousness. And through Christ, the death we deserve is taken away. And in his resurrection, so we are also resurrected. We'll get a new body, free of sin, free of pain, free of all these things that we're afraid of. But something that you hopefully remember from a few minutes ago that, that we haven't really talked about is all of these things that we have, all these fears, all of these needs, all of it seems to be everywhere else in our life except one spot. It's the only place where those things don't enter. It's spiritual needs delivered spiritually. The wisdom that we have is the one thing that can drive out everything else. So if you're worried about money, you could work really hard, but I think the only thing you can't earn more of is time. And so if you're already working a ton of hours, you have to sacrifice something else to make something else in your life worse in order to have more time at your job. So if you have a family at home and you have an eight-hour workday and you're like, man, I just need to earn more money. Well, now you have a 10-hour workday and two hours less with your family. We only have so much time. There's only so much space in our world and I think that no matter which of the fears that we look at, if we just constantly push back to what is the Bible saying? What is it teaching us? Why does it say that each day has enough trouble of its own? Why is, why is God so concerned about storing treasures in heaven? It's because the one thing that we really, really need to help us overcome all of the other things in our life, that one thing is the one thing that only gets found in here. It's the one thing that only gets found when you approach God's throne and you're just in front of him in prayer and through reading scripture, you encounter a wisdom that is otherworldly. It drives out all the other concerns of your life so that you're able to actually trust that you'll be provided for. If you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all of these things will be given to you as well. It's a finite phrase. They will be. It's not they could be or they might be. It's a, it's a finished idea. All of these things will be given to you as well. So I said at the beginning this was a sermon about rules, and I haven't given you any rules yet, and so now is the time. Um, but it's not, I don't want you to think of this as a, a moment to be like, oh no, here are all the things I have to do. Because keep in mind, we've already talked about how Christ takes away all of those things for us. So this is a way in which we get to live in response. Which is the really cool thing about the gospel of Jesus is all of the guilt that we have is taken away by his grace. And in gratitude, we respond to what he's doing in our life. And so the two rules are these. Rule number one, 
seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's the first thing you should always do. You get up in the morning, you preach the gospel to yourself. Pray to God, thank him for what's going on. Keep him at the forefront of every task that you go through. Always seek after him. And then rule number two, trust that all these things will be given to you as well. Because it's one thing to believe that God can do all of those things. It is another thing entirely to believe that God will. And I wonder how many of us are sitting on the fence of can and will. And so as we enter into a new year, let this be the year of your life where will give you all of these things as a belief that you have. That they will, will be given to you as well. They will. And so I called it rules to live by. And they're not really things that I think nobody knew before. This wasn't like a, you know, four tips for having a great 2024. I, I didn't want you to walk away thinking, man, if I just do those things, the world's going to be perfect because that's not what the Bible promises us. He says every day has enough trouble of its own. So Jesus isn't, isn't ignorant to the fact that tomorrow might, might be hard. Or next year might be really hard. There might be things in your life that are just awful. You might lose somebody. You might be the one that gets lost. You might walk away from your faith or you might have to walk away from your job or your car might go up in flames or it's, I don't know. The world could just crumble around you. But if you're seeking after him, always, none of that stuff matters because you'll have the trust that through all of that, he's with you and you don't need anything else. I think those are pretty solid rules to live by. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for the way that you have worked so gracefully in our lives to save us from the sin that we build up every day. And we ask that you would help us to live by these two simple ideas, that we would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, and that we would trust that you will provide for us all the things we need. Shape our hearts to look the way you want them to look, Lord. Shape our lives to look the way you want them to look. So that at the end of the day, we might come before you and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Bless us as we sing to you, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.